right. Hello? Sorry guys, we are just waiting for this to start, waiting for two of our attendants come through, um, our other speakers to come through, if attendees can see us already. I'm not really sure because I can't see an audience, so <laughs> um, please bear with us a second. This is why you need music, you know, at an event at the beginning. <laughs> so everyone's not stood here just kind of like, okay. <laughs> My name isn't Roman Hansen, by the way. I don't know why it's come up on there. <laughs> There's two of us because I went through the link. Da, 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 da. Hi guys, so as the people from the team that are on here, um, if you've come through the link for the panelists and we're not speaking on this, could you possibly turn it off so we can have like a fuller view of just the speakers, if that's okay guys? That would be delicious. We are waiting for one more. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Okay, I think I'm gonna start, um, just make a start and an introduction whilst we're waiting for things to work out. We've got 20 people here. Um, so we're gonna keep rolling. I think everyone, can everyone hear me? Um, yeah, well, the panelists, I can't see the conversation, so we'll just kick off. So my name's Hannah Nome and I'll be moderating today for Youth Advocates for Humane Technology, if I say it correctly. And essentially, I my background is, is I worked in UNESCO as an intern in the, Division for Freedom of Expression and Media Development, and specifically looking at the sustainable development of the internet. And I also led some youth advocate movements within UNESCO and also within Young UN. And I've got involved in a group that I met through the Center of Humane Technologies events. So we're not affiliated with them, but we came through their events went to the networking event afterwards and a group of us met there's about 11 of us and we just don't stop talking really we meet every week and we continue conversations about surrounding digital ethics and what how they're affecting our societies retrospectively and ideas we have to maybe solve them essentially we are going to go into the overview of what our concerns as a group kind of are what we're interested in and hopefully inspire you to engage people in conversation and kind of different ways that you can think about your advocacy and whether you can find other people who can help leverage your voice um, within your society, within your uh, communities, your schools, your workplace, etc. Get the gist. So in our comment section, which I can't currently see, so I'm speaking blind right now. <laughs> um, I what well, two of our um, group Harsha will be sharing a type form if you want to keep in contact with us uh, going forward, which will be reaching out to anybody interested in learning more about our group um, going forward. And also Hema Tanoka will be answering any questions and engaging with you guys there. So I hope that was a good overview. Um, I hope everyone got the gist of it. 
I would like to my panelists uh, to kind of introduce themselves um, and just a little bit about their background before we get into the conversation. Yeah, um, let me start. I'm uh, Roman. I'm from Germany. I'm a social science student. I have a little bit of a background in computer science, not so much though, and my main background is in advertising. And in there, I've used platforms like Facebook and others to advertise for big brands. And doing that has sort of given me an insight and um, also made me question how positive these platforms actually are for us as a user. Um, yeah, that's my main interest. Thank you, Roman. Derek, can you introduce yourself, please? Sorry, I am having some uh, technical issues, but I'm still solving it, but I'll still introduce myself meanwhile. I'm Derek and I'm from Singapore. Um, I spent the, the past uh, three, four years in the FinTech industry and uh, had some results there. And now I just uh, channel my resource to doing good. And uh, currently I'm focused on uh, kickstarting a movement in Singapore together with the support of the local government. And I hope to share more uh, later during our session. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And Julia? Hi, everyone. I'm Julia. I'm from France. Um, I've studied business um, in college. And as my interest in technology grew, I took classes in computer science, in ethics, and in philosophy, which um, led me to study how ethical concerns were implemented in the development and deployment of artificial intelligence. Um, I also have a background in community building and sustainable development. Um, I worked for the past four years to create a movement in um, how to bring education for sustainable development into schools in about 80 countries. And so I hope to share a bit more about how we can learn from the climate movement um, and apply that to create a movement towards more human technology. Thank you. And we also have another speaker, Abhishek, who isn't, is also having technical difficulties at the moment. But Abhishek is based in India and he will be covering um, around kind of like the user um, terms and conditions um, that we want to kind of get into as well. Um, so with that, Roman, would you like to introduce us with what you're going to be talking about today? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the reasons why we use social media platforms and what effects that actually has. Um, well, for all of us there, I mean, you and all the visitors, there's a reason why we use social media platforms and it's um, social interactions, but it's also uh, information seeking um, or pastime or, or just entertainment and relaxation. Now, especially the last few are, are not so new. Um, and we've done that with TV or maybe even books for a long time. Um, so um, if it weren't for social media, we would probably be using these tools to entertain us uh, a few hours each day, but there is a difference. And I wanna explain that a little bit more deeply. Um, for TV and books for that matter, they are optimized for let's say a million people um, in audience. And the difference to social media is that our feed, everyone's feed is optimized for one person, for, for us or for you. And these platforms do a really good job in doing that. In 2018, a Facebook executive sort of told the advertisers at a conference that everyone is scrolling around 300 feet or 19 meters each day on their phone. That's a lot. That's really a lot. And to achieve such a high number, I think it's really, um, these platforms have to do really everything to, um, to get our attention and they don't shy away from much. And um, so if you're on your app and you're scrolling and you become bored, platforms have to find a way to keep you engaged. And they do that by um, switching from your family photos to news and from news to today's news and from today's news to breaking news. And if that is not enough, they don't even shy away from uh, sharing extremist or fake news or maybe even conspiracy theories. And it's not that these extreme things are, are new in our world or even on the internet, but they have sort of come out of this, this one place that is confined and only for a few people that are searching for it and have now gotten the chance to reach everyone if he's receptive or she's receptive to it. 
Now, the fact that an average human, that um, me and everyone in the audience can have news that are um, from such sources as their only news input has to have an effect on our society and how we, how we deal, especially in societies where it's about finding common ground. Now, to make this a little bit more clear, um, if, if you have to resolve a disagreement with someone you know, it is always good to start with a common interest or a common base. And from there on, you can sort of lay out your disagreement and you can either persuade the other one or you're getting persuaded, but you need this basis to sort of grow out an argument. And this is the same for democra uh, democratic processes, for settling societal decisions. You need to have a common ground to sort of build on and then find the right way to go forward. Now, if this isn't there, if there is a lack of shared truth, or if you even believe that the other one is misinformed by fake news, and they probably think the same about you, then you cannot do that anymore. And it doesn't really matter if the question is liberalism versus republicanism, nationalism or globalism, or corona and no corona. Now, what does that mean? And actually, why is that? Why? for what is this done? I mean, we all agree that we do need these processes and that we need to have a common truth. So why is it not there? And the sad answer is sort of that most of these platforms don't have this as their main interest. Their main interest might be to keep us there longer and to show us advertising. Now, I wanna encourage everyone who's watching to the next time you're on your app, count how many posts go by until you find an advertising. For me, it's around seven posts on Instagram and only four if I am on Facebook on my laptop. That's a lot of ads, especially given how far we scroll each day. Roman, that was super insightful, particularly linking to how our personal use can actually be like visualized in a distance way. I, I find that that's so shocking. I think if I'd be doing more exercise, if I could apply that to my, like the feet that I walk instead of on my, my phone, it'd be really helpful. And I'm using a timer, so sorry about that. It's not my alarm. Um, okay, so we're waiting for Abhishek to join us. So whilst we wait for him to join us, Derek, could you tell us about what you're doing in Singapore? Like you're trying to engage the government, you're trying to engage youth voices there and how you can find like a way to engage a conversation and a dialogue that's national and potentially inspire international collaboration and movement. Um, could you possibly like extrapolate on that for me? Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Roman and Hannah. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I, I think Abhishek is on. Uh, would, Abhishek, could you hear us or would you like to go first? Yeah, Derek, I can hear you. Great. Uh, Abhishek, would you like to take it on? <laughs> oh. Abhishek, can you hear us? I, yeah, I think there is a little uh, audio disturbance. Uh, okay, so Derek, can you continue with your just introducing okay, you sure. and Abhishek can go after right, that would right. be delicious. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so Abhishek was supposed to talk about some technologies yeah. which I wanted to talk on uh, following Abhishek, but uh, I will focus now on the movement first um, and then I will then hand it over to Abhishek on the technological part. Okay, so in Singapore, we have uh, an ongoing Together Movement, and this uh, Together Movement was initiated in 2019, June, uh, with the desire for the, uh, from the government to work and partner with the citizens. So uh, as a youth, I saw it as a great opportunity to hijack and leverage on what uh, my government has started, uh, only because they would, of course, bring along their marketing resources and, and other resources to make sure the movement is sustainable. So on my part, I thought it would be quite uh, fitting for the youth uh, all over the world to work together on initiating uh, what can then be called uh, a World Together Day. And, and the reason is uh, as such, because you know, amidst a global pandemic, uh, which has cost millions of jobs and thousands of lives around the world, uh, the need for people to work together and tackle global challenges is more crucial than ever. Uh, so many countries, all the countries that we are living in today are interconnected and interdependent. 
So are the problems affecting us today? And I list some examples that includes COVID-19, climate change, sustainable development, and so on. So we see people all around the world, not just youths, seniors, and adults, all age demographics are stepping forward to lend a helping hand. Uh, but many of them have found it very difficult Many of us have found it very difficult uh, to work together with existing stakeholders. And these stakeholders may come from the people sector, the pri private sector, or even the public sector. So, you know, if it's already so difficult, let alone uh, working between countries. Sorry, Abhishek, do you mind muting on your, on your call, please? Oh, thanks. Great. So I, I was just sharing that, uh, you know, it's really very difficult to work across the three sectors of a country, so let alone between countries. Um, and then we also notice that those people who have embarked on a self-fulfilling journey to tackle problems at the local, regional, or global level, uh, we see a lot of uh, issues uh, when they work independently. So for those who work independently, they go into a rabbit hole, uh, and the deeper they go, the lonelier it gets for them. So those that persisted with the efforts, despite all the odds stacked against them, they are often underserved and underappreciated. So it really discourages many young people, especially uh, people who have gone through the university education. And you know, after university, we think, of course, the natural course of action is to take on a job. So. It, where all these people who have tried and they they have so uh, challenging road ahead and so underserved and underappreciated, it really discourages all the young people to step forward considering our opportunity cost. So the question I, I like to pose to everyone, and this uh, is in line with the World Together Day that all of us can work towards on, is how might we provide an opportunity for people worldwide to talk about problems at the local, regional, or global level and discuss how all stakeholders can come together to tackle problems worldwide. And the, the, the intention is how can we find a calendar day, uh, which is, for example, 31st December, where all of us, regardless of our nationality, are already coming together to celebrate New Year's Eve, setting New Year's resolution, uh, and spending time with our family and our loved ones. So how can we leverage on this kind of efforts days where we are already setting New Year's resolution, days where we are already reflecting upon the year to really use it as, an, an, as a platform to, to invite other stakeholders into the conversation only because for those stakeholders, they may look at it as a publicity, they may look at it as a public relations. Great, great for them, but even greater for us is that we get their listening year, we get to put solutions on the table, we get to work with our local stakeholders, our regional stakeholders, and our global stakeholders. And I really, really think that this is something that the young people can take lead in. Uh, this is not something that uh, the existing establishment can do so without the support of ours. And I think it is even more possible now that there's technologies, many of them open source. And I think I'll hand it over to Abhishek very shortly to talk about some of the technologies. But as we see today, and, and we see uh, during COVID-19, uh, the change management that has occurred, where everyone is now very comfortable to meet online, the potential for people all over the world to work together on something is tremendous. And I hope, uh, as I hand it over to Abhishek, that we start to think about all the solutions that we have today, and many of them are free for our use. How can we use them for the benefits that it brings and to solve even some of the challenges that these technologies that uh, have created over time over the past three, four years? Thank you. Uh, and I'll hand it over first to Hannah and then uh, uh, Abhishek. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. It's so interesting to see how you leveraged uh, your position and how you saw an opportunity that the government was asking people to engage with them and you seized that. And I think people need to be active citizens and really listen for when their governments are trying to ask youth what do you want because they do ask sometimes <laughs> and and seize the opportunity don't wait for someone else to do it and Derek is a great example of that um so Abhishek thank you um well great to have you here <laughs> um <laughs> and, and please can you just dive into the, the sort of overview you wanted to give around kind of like user terms and conditions um, Hey, hey there. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, to give a brief background about myself, I'm Abhishek from Hyderabad, India, and I'm currently consulting few business, small businesses to scale their operations digitally and efficiently. My other areas of passion include technology, entrepreneurship, and ethics. So before we 
so before we start before we start uh, discussing about the topic i wanted to tell you an interesting fact do you know that an average human reading speed is almost 200 words per minute and if i talk about the facebook contract it's almost 15000 words now let's calculate how much time it takes to read the terms of users and user conditions it's almost 100 minutes and if i try to print this on an a4 page it's almost 50 pages so much so much for that terms and conditions right did you ever wonder why these big companies or big social media platforms try to make you read so much vague user terms and conditions the problem is very the problem is very simple and yet complex see majority of the companies try to bury the users in two verbose and vague terms to try to extract as much data as possible which are not actually required for uh, their services they, they that include the, your hard disk information your server your other activities on online and right now the growing perception is that users are aware of your of these tactics and they can see the vicious loop they are into and they now know that they are the product themselves it's time for the new age companies and upcoming digital services to upgrade these obsolete terms and conditions and rather focus on building trust as the core metric for their long term sustainability there have been few breakthroughs uh, in the form of gdpr regulations brought out by european union which is a good start to maintain individual data privacy but when i talk from a business perspective i think of, of, i have a, i have a small framework which can be used uh, and it it is it is as simple as how it works and what bits of data are absolutely essential for the data services and function so that brings us to another another important question what are the current challenges being faced by these social media companies and have they really taken any steps so far uh, and do we have any other ideas to focus upon and which we can use to build upon these problems the current challenges if i talk about the whatsapp it is one of the most popular messaging platform because of the user base of almost 200 million users and there have been many 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 uh, many many regulations and many kind of pressures on whatsapp uh, to to break their encryption and it is also very difficult to track the source of the misleading and fake messages due to the cultural and social dynamics although there have been few steps taken by the platforms that include tagging the forward messages or limiting the number of forwards per user and even capping the group size but these are half hearted measures and i can say that uh, st still lot needs to be done when trying to curb or regulate these platforms there are few interesting ideas which 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 have been uh, which have been tinkered upon and many companies are trying to utilize this for example a kind of decentralized platform which my friend derek was also trying to tell you previously it is a kind of ledger that records the real time activity between the peers in the same network i would like to quote a small example of steemit and dtube which you can browse upon uh, later this is a kind of social networking platform ba based upon entirely decentralized theme there is another interesting idea that you can own your own server for complete autonomy over your content and what happens with your data you are your own boss for your data that is another alternative and there is also a group of affiliates called as indie web who are on the mission of developing their own social media platforms keeping only the best of the social media features and completely discarding the most negative perceived most commonly perceived negatives so this is what these are the main ideas which which can be experimented upon and these are being tried by many dif different social media and uh, technology companies and when i talk about the people who are trying to work in this space especially the human tech space we need to understand that human technology is not it, it's not it's not uh, it's not a very simple it's it's not a simple definition human technology takes a person's vulnerabilities ethics and other core human values into priority while designing any business model system or platform the main core essence of the human technology is it incorporates a mindfulness aspect which is mostly missing in every tech companies of today i would there is a small there is a small and interesting example of headspace 
many of you might be aware it is one of the one of a good example of human tech because it rewards people for making a positive change in their lives and i am so i'm so glad the developers are mindful about the users needs and distractions and they comp- they almost avoid frequent push notifications and other alerts which you might be encountering with different apps also there are people like mr tristan harris azar askin david jay and even our own susan renolds who are spearheading this revolution and they need more people who are from different and diverse backgrounds such as technologists students law lawmakers and ethical advocates to come forward and you know make make this a revolution make bring out the change in the society about all these aspects over to you okay. hana thank you abhishek i like the revolution wow starting something here aren't we <laughs> um so with where we've come from now i think julia's is a great opportunity to now give us the overview of what we can learn from particularly one that's very much in our mind of like a movement which was cli- the climate crisis movement and how people mobilized young voices to really empower change to happen um so if you'd like to discuss that it'd be delicious Really, thank you, Anna, and thank you, everyone, for your great insightful comments. Um, yeah, today I'd like to focus on this last part of, of the talk on on how what role we can have as young people, uh, what role we can play, and also on the importance of raising awareness around these issues of creating more human technology and, and the need to do so. And the way I would like to do it is by sharing a few things I've learned being involved in the climate um, climate movement in, in the climate crisis space and how we can apply that to create a movement towards um, asking for more human technology. Um, the first thing that's great is that awareness is rising. Uh, we have seen the social documentary, probably all of us attending today, um, and also many more people are talking about that than maybe two, three years ago. Um, awareness might not be so um, key, but as we've seen in the climate crisis movement as well, awareness is really the first step. Um, if you don't have awareness, people just are not talking about the issues. And when people are not talking about the issues, nothing changed from government standpoint, from big technological company standpoint. So the first thing that I think all of us can do is really wa- raise awareness around the need for more human technology, around what technology, what place technology plays in our lives, We're reflecting on what place we wish they um, took in our lives and what we wish these technology, how we wish these technologies would be built, um, built in a more human centric way um, and built more with um, the user in mind rather than the advertisers as, um, Roman mentioned. The second point about awareness that makes it so important is that the type of problem we are facing now needs systemic change. And it needs the coordination of many different actors. We need regulators to get involved, we need big technological companies to make design choices that are more geared toward human technology. And the only way to have this type of systemic change is really to bring all society on board and only raising awareness around you, your peers can really do that. When I started working in the sustainable development space over four years ago, um, a lot of people in my business school were telling me, well, what you're doing is really nice, but you know, business is business. So if they want, you know, all company needs to make money and that's what their role is. And I knew that there was something more there that could be done because um, you know, the climate crisis was not going to go away in any shape or form. And it's the same with technology in a sense. Technology is part of our lives and um, there's no doubt that it's incredibly um, useful to our lives, but the negative effects of technology also need to be addressed. And that's not going to go anyway, anywhere. And as we use more and more and more technology, the need to have this technology built in a human-centric way is becoming more and more important. Um, as we've seen with the youth climate um, movement, young people have an incredible, an incredibly important place um, in raising awareness, but also in organizing themselves to bring solutions to the table. Um, young people are some of the main consumers of social media. Um, and so as such, we have first our power as consumers. Um, as consumers, we have the choice on how, which apps we use, um, how we decide to use them, and the voices that we decide to share um, on these platforms. The second thing is, as young people, um, we also have um, 
a great opportunity to educate our peers and parents and regulators about this platform that they don't still use the same way as we do to connect with much, much wider sometimes, like it's sometimes much more of an integral part of our social lives than it is for um, older adults. And so we have this great opportunity as young people to explain and, and really engage in inter intergenerational talks about the importance of social media, but also what we could have as um, more human centric social media. And finally, as young people, we can also bring solutions forwards. And that's why the climate crisis, um, the climate movement really, really took off is because instead of, um, you know, many groups advocating, advocating um, for the need to recognize the urgency of climate change, we started to have young people also bring solutions forward, creating solutions, building to movements together to raise awareness around that. And I think we're at the point on the development of technology where we young people can also do that. Um, I'd like to share a sort of a metaphor that we've all um, thought about in, in that small group is seeing technology and our use of technology as um, the same way as we do with food. So when you're a little kid, you learn what's good for you and what's not good for you. So, you know, donuts are good, but maybe if you need, if you eat donuts every day, all day, you're probably gonna have health problems, right? Um, so we learn to have a healthy diet when we're a kid. And I think with technology, as they take more and more um, an important place in our life, it's gonna be more and more important to see to kind of consider our technology called diet. Um, there are uses of technology that are healthy and that are good for us. And there are uses of technology that um, are less helpful. I'm thinking of my three hour YouTube rabbit holes into cat videos or cooking videos. Maybe I don't need to watch three hours of cooking videos. Um, and that's what we call kind of the digital donut, right? It's, you can have a donut from time to time, maybe one Sunday, it's fine if you spend an hour looking at cooking shows on YouTube. But if you have like donuts every day, that's probably not good for you. So to conclude on that section, um, what I wanna say is young people have an incredibly important role in building solutions. And that's what we're trying to do with this group that somehow still meets every Friday night um, trying to create solution for three hours every Friday night to, to help empower our peers um, to take on these issues. And the second thing is there are also several steps that we can do as individuals, as young people and individuals. And for that, I'd like to pass it off to Roman who's gonna share with us a few steps, direct steps we can take. Yeah, sure. Um... I think there's uh, three areas that we can focus on or that everyone should focus on when you want to um, spearhead this or at least create movement here. Um, first is be more aware. Um, I think everyone who's here has done the first step in that. Um, most have to watch the documentary, but also read, listen and watch everything you can find that is interesting to you. And, and also go beyond that and monitor yourself, not just read about it, but try to see where you are yourself falling into these traps or using apps in a way that you didn't really intend to. Um, I think this is the first step. Maybe if you have an iPhone, install the uh, screen time widget or on an Android, look into your screen time every once in a while to be more aware. The second is change your behavior. Um, think about free phone free mornings or phone free evenings. Um, restrict your screen time or specific apps and maybe turn off notifications. This has helped me and many people that I know to be more concentrated on stuff that they're working on. Um, and if you want to really go full, um, why don't you delete an app or an account. I know this is extreme. I'm just playing it, uh, saying it. Um, and then I think the third step is um, the most important, um, which is become more outspoken about this subject. Um, talk about it to peers. We've said this before and share knowledge that you have gained. Um, we ourselves have created a board where we put out articles and books. Hannah's probably going to mention where you can find it later. And sort of just share your information and share it in your in your community and with your friends if you go to a restaurant i know this is not realistic right now but at some point it's going to be again if you go to a restaurant and you see a friend and um, pull out their phone in a situation where you wouldn't say oh we're just pulling out our phones right now um why don't you talk about it um say hey why are you 
on your phone right now and do you think this is good for a situation and try to bring them into the conversation i think these three are the most important right now but of course long term we do have to develop steps to get this more political and more into the technology spaces and i'm happy to join one of the 90 minute uh, activity runs later i think that's gonna create some more ideas on that Rowan, thank you. That was epic. Um, to any of the attendees, please do link to us through the um, the chat. We've got a type form there. We'd love to stay in contact with you. It, you don't have to just be a youth advocate, right? You can be someone who's in a company and you're, you're, or you're a parent or you're seeing societal problems happen around you where you are in your world and where you live in the world and you're thinking how how can this continue? How is this is unsustainable? Like what can I do? And there are some amazing resources that are on the Center for Humane Technologies website. We keep on turning up to the events every Friday. Do go. If you want to meet people and network, find the virtual events online and participate. Don't be scared to talk because essentially we're not experts. We're just seeing a problem and we want to understand why is it still there and why is something not happening about it. And do be inspired by the power of the climate change movement there are intersections across both movements of what is going to be happening out of what's happened with the social dilemma and be confident you meet people from around the world my social is now on a friday and i'm talking about things that interest me and connecting with people that are also trying to make a difference so don't be afraid to do that um and another way of making sure that you're when you're engaging people in conversations, don't just tell people things are bad for them. Invite them, like Roman said, into the conversation. Ask them how does it make them feel. Don't attack people. Say you're spending too much time on your phone. You're doing to this because essentially people are very, are very defensive then. And I think if anything learns about outrage on social media, it's just not effective and it makes people more angry. So be the be the peace broker, the negotiator, <laughs> facilitate, become a facilitator. And if you want to stay in contact, like I said, please do uh, message us and we'll be at the CHT events every Friday. We're always networking and you can meet some incredible people that want to help you there. So I don't, um, if we've got any Q&A, sorry, I didn't check that. Um, oh, great conversation. Thank you, Manuel. I don't know if we can answer the decentralized system question very briefly. Um, if you come to the Friday night meetings, if you go to the CHT website, they have conversation, they say start a conversation and they've got a list of events. So just like jump on to the calls the, and afterwards they throw you into like an air meet tables and it's quite fun because actually you don't know who you're going to meet. It's, it's <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, you can, we met Susan through it and that's why we're here. You know, we've only been meeting for three weeks um, and we would be delighted to send you any resources when we've got those together. We've actually got a Notion page and you can contact us through there. So thank you so much for coming guys. Thank you, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, anything you guys would like to add? It's more relaxed than this normally. Like we're not as normally as formal as this. So it feels very strange to us because normally like, what do you think about this? <laughs> I, I would just add that CHT is a center for human technology. Um, so just for everyone interested, um, go, um, it, it's um, the, most of you probably know that they created the social dilemma um, documentary. Um, they have also great resources um, through there. I think um, one thing to learn from, from the climate crisis and that j just to finish what on when you're saying, Hannah, is also create solutions, right? The first step is awareness for yourself, for your peers, and then see how you can create solutions. And that's what we're doing, we're trying at least to do with this group is that, you know, we are aware of the problem um, and that's why we all joined the, the CHD events. Um, and now we're trying to build solutions. Hopefully you can see us back in a month or two and we'll have all this like a first step towards taking different, um, creating that movement and, and um, creating these solutions. And that's something you can do. You just need to meet people that are interested in the problem and then create the solutions that you want to see in the space. Um, we also have a question. Thank you, Julia. I think like what you've outlined about like the emphasis on the climate movement is so important. And we've reiterated that in our group so much. And I think that's the core message from what we've learned. So we've got a question saying, um, question is why is distance learning more stressful for children? I don't think we've got that much time, but I guess one thing that causes stress is that 
you have to kind of learn a new way of interacting with people online like we're very comfortable we're very engaged we nod at each other or we're like Ooh. and you have to kind of understand social cues and I think the problem is online is that when it's digital in learning environment um, it's really hard to understand cues and you kind of feel afraid to learn out loud so I'd say maybe trying to find resources online that can make people feel that they are in a safe environment to learn and no questions are stupid question and there's no wrong answer and when you create those environments then more people can kind of articulate what their thoughts are maybe that's a way of answering that one is that everything guys i think we're at the end um this wraps up at in about a minute i think so thank you all for attending i don't really know how to end this <laughs> So <laughs> it's going to clear like um, just join us and, and read as much as you can and we'll be happy to connect with you further as we figure this for ourselves and create solutions for ourselves. Roman, any additionals? Um, I think we can thank the organizers for this event and I'm also very excited to see what's going to come after us. I mean, having this position as a first talk is very exciting, but I'm also very excited to see what other people are saying about this and to meet people over in the more smaller groups later. So yeah, thank you again to everyone who invited us and to make this possible. <laughs> Okay, and go through the notion to find our other team. It's, we've got 11 of us on the team. We are, this is a very small part of us and they've been working equally as hard on the Miro board to try and get some of this conversation going in a week. So I just want to say like big energy to our team <laughs> um, and hopefully you'll see them be talking in the future because we want to alternate it around. So thank you guys. I'm going to end now. Bye. Thank you, Anna.